way of introducing myself, my first job was working for Angus and Robertson Publishers, which is Australia's oldest book publisher. Um, and that's where I came across the idea of very old literary estates and how they could be given new life and rejuvenated. Uh, that's where I learned about really the Industrial Revolution because book publishing is one of the first industries. Uh, and so the whole notion of workflow um, became something that I learned and I was hired as the in-house lawyer at Angus and Robinson Publishers because they had rather complex film agreements that they had to deal with. People wanted film rights in Careful He Might Hear You, My Brilliant Career, The Man From Snowy River, so poems, novels, etc. This was during that 1980s where uh, Australian nationalism was uh, on the rise or being reinvented. And so uh, the film agreements when I began in 1983 were five pages long and when I left were 45 pages long, which is an indication of the amount of change and sophistication that came about in that industry. And I mentioned the film industry after the book industry because film is par excellence an industrial process. So literary works of course feed into film, uh, as does music, as does graphic design, set design, you name it. So. That's my background, and I think we're often shaped by our first job. I certainly was. The focus of most of today is actually one, is on one branch of IP, which is copyright law. And while copyright law, you can read the Copyright Act and get a good understanding of the legal rights, when it comes to practice, copyright is quite complex in that each industry has its own workflow, its own asset types, its own economics and so copyright assets management is really a niche thing so a film lawyer a, a music lawyer a book lawyer a, a, a software lawyer aren't necessarily the same person i uh, see this topic as essentially involving these various cells so beginning with the blue cells we have ip diagnostics which is sort of working out what have we got uh, copyright, we've got some trademark, we may have some confidential information. What's our strategy? How are we going to sort of do stuff? Are we protecting it, making money out of it, licensing it? IP rights clearance. Are there other people's rights embedded in ours? Uh, if it's a novel, mm -hmm. did we have a big quote from some other novel? If it's a non-fiction work like the Encyclopedia Britannica, we have rights galore that we've got to acquire from lots of different people. Uh, social media is the same. That's why we all enter into the $2 billion, two billion person contract known as the Facebook contract or the $1 billion contract known as the YouTube contract. They are acquiring the license to put our content onto their platform. So that leads into IP management and protection. You only know what you've got to manage if you've done this blue stuff. And there's a reason why that is in purple. And we'll get to that reason uh, momentarily. <coughs> And there's a reason why the very next box, which is enterprise structuring, is in brown. Because it signifies bricks and mortar, enterprises, organisations, structuring. It's putting it into some um, uh, organisational ownership arrangement. So the ownership, of course, could be by an individual, it could be by a trust, it could be by a company, it could be co-owned by different people, or it could be a whole swag of people, as is the case in film, who own different slithers of the rights, who have given in some cases, complete assignment of their copyright, in other cases, a license of their copyright. So it could have been the person who did the music for the film, who licensed it, but kept the right to have that music separately adapted for some other purpose. So enterprise structuring pulls all the blue stuff and the uh, purple stuff and gives it a structure. And then we have the people who look after the last three cells who are really commercial people. Uh, thinking about the operations of the IP enterprise, how to manage the IP assets, uh, and then do what is the perennial nowadays, and that is business development. So that's like an overview of legal modelling. Now, from the beginning, and of course we have to go back to Mesopotamia again, though I just described Levant, but right next door, the oldest book that we still have, the Epic of Gilgamesh, was written and was written probably for royalty. Very few people could read in 1,500, 3,000 years before Christ. But the point is there were creators of works and there were consumers. What happened over the next period of several years was, was this, that 
When book publishing became an industrial process, we had the blue people turn up, the publishers, uh, and subsequent to that, because towns and cities got bigger, um, it meant that you had to have people like wholesalers and retailers in between the consumer and the publisher. Um, and you then had, in the 19th century onwards, things like libraries and book clubs, etc. So I've just described here then a value chain that relates to literature, fiction or non-fiction. Um, and uh, while you get a lot of uh, propaganda saying, you know, publishers are rip-off artists, uh, you know, the poor old starving author, when I was at Angus Robertson, it seemed to me that the typical author, when they had a work that had some value and was reselling, was getting 10%. And it seemed to me the publisher was getting 10%. In other words, it was a relatively equal deal. So what happens is, just work with mm. the numbers, mm. so the book would be sold, let's say, for a dollar by the publisher, um, recommended retail price, um, and the book would be given to the wholesalers and the retailers. The retailer would sell it, um, um, Dimmicks, let's say. The retailer would buy the book at, say, 50 cents. Therefore, the book, book retailer would make 50 cents uh, profit and then pay that 50 cents to the publisher. The publisher would keep 10 cents, give 10 cents to the, or, to the author, and the other 30 cents would go towards printing, marketing, etc. This value chain is not the same in music and it's not the same in software and it's not the same in film but the principles are, are very similar so the economics of copyright uh, and how all of this works um, is fundamental to exploitation of, of copyright works a complexity now I will add is the notion of subsidiary rights so if you if with a book uh, the primary right is the right to have the book printed and sold by somebody, copied, sold. The subsidiary, secondary if you like, right, are all the other rights that the Copyright Act gives to the creator. So, if it's a novel, it might become a film, it might become a software program, it might become a, a stage play, um, it might become all sorts of things. It's, there is no limit to the imagination that human beings have of what it might become. So managing subsidiary rights is a big part of what publishers do with their authors. Um, and when I was giving the example of film, think of the what you traditionally used to be the six or seven Hollywood studios. Think of them as publishers. And think of the music companies like Sony, Bertelsmann uh, as publishers. Um, now, one unfortunate reality of the last 10 or 20 years is that, broadly speaking, while authors of literary works are still earning something, musicians appear not to be, and filmmakers, I think, have always struggled. Uh, so the economics of a lot of these industries are changing, and we'll come to that uh, later on um, as to why that is so. But here's an element of why that is so. Uh, the digital distribution of assets has meant that there's many different ways of charging for it. Over here, the physical thing, the as we used to say in the 1990s, the atoms would get distributed, not the bits. So when the atoms were distributed, the book being an atom, uh, or a collection of atoms, when the atom got distributed, it physically could be um, um, sold at the retailer level and uh, the accounting could be done. Part of the problem of the dematerialization of the book, the film, the audio, software was always dematerialized. Part of the problem was that a whole bunch of new players that weren't part of the old playing group could then utilize new ways of charging for things and break into these markets. One of those new ways was free. Google, Facebook, Apple using advertising. 90% of what Google gets is advertising. These were not ways of running a business for publishers. I mean, if you look at some of the old 
uh, books you'd see sometimes in the 50s and 60s, there would be ads at the back, uh, but they'd just be ads for other books. There wouldn't be ads for other things. So, so these new mechanisms for making money has demolished a lot of, of the players that were in the prime market. Um, since we're talking about estates and estate management, uh, we need to also mention uh, these four uh, light blue people. So we've got agents who can act for authors, for artists, for actors, and they're managing the economics for the creators or the owners. And then when the creator or the individual owner dies, uh, if they have a will and it's all clear, it goes to their estate. Um, and so the executor plays a role in terms of what to do. Um, and in some cases, some people might have formed a trust to deal with a literary estate. So trustees could have a role there as well. We'll get onto that in more detail later on. We used to have the notion of uh, the publisher with the author and then there were readers. Remember those top and down, the purple and the green, right? The publisher and the consumer. Oh, look, the digital titans came in, who became easy distribution platforms. So authors could publish directly on them, but suddenly some of them said, we want 30%. Think of that. What did I tell you? How much did a publisher get? Yeah. Yeah. Why does Why does Apple get 30%? Oh, because it just decided to, because Steve Jobs, when he met with the six guys in the desperate to stay alive music industry, they said, yeah, fine, 30%. And then Google went, oh, yeah, 30%, we like that. And then, you know, Amazon. So, so the thing is that there is an economics at work that turns most creators increasingly into the digital proletariat. It's really quite simple in, in its basic concepts. One, you have to have an author. A computer is not an author. When Telstra tried to protect the, the yellow pages from people digitally copying it, uh, it lost in court because the court looked at the fact that Telstra was using lots and lots of computers to data match and check, and the court said, but where's the author? And Telstra went, ah, oh, well, ah, uh, they lost. So you have to have an individual, you have to have a, a human being. Uh, it could be two individuals or more. Secondly, you have to have a work that copyright recognises as being a work. So a work, literary, which is text, artistic, which is graphics, images, and then there's quaintly called other subject matter, films, music, etc. So you have to have something that the author has created, pretty obvious. Uh, then you have to have that thing being original. The bar for originality in copyright is not very high. It's not like patent law, which says that it must be novel. Um, finally, you have to have the copyright work recorded in a material form. So if I sing a song right now, uh, the only way it's being recorded is on this iPhone, is on this Zoom, and on that Canon. And, and um, I'm going to claim ownership to all three material recordings. But if there was no recording, there's no copyright. Okay, fine. So they're the basic principles. Basically, in order to prove that there's an infringement of copyright, uh, you have to indicate that, yes, there was, that your work was copyright, number one, um, that your work wasn't just an idea, because you can't copyright an idea. An idea could be, look, I have this really nice idea that I'm going to do uh, all jewellery in, uh, in a purple box, but don't tell anybody. Don't tell Tiffany. Yeah, you know, mine's going to be purple box. That's not copyright. It, the, the box may be registered as a trademark in purple, etc., but it's not copyright. Copyright has to be an expression. Um, so in, in order to attack somebody for infringement, I've also got to prove that they've copied a substantial part. Taking a little bit doesn't matter. Uh, there's no mathematics to it. It's not that um, belief that some people have that you can't take 10% of something or 5% of something. No, no. I won't go into why that's so, but essentially the law is trying to uh, apply a sense of justice. Uh, it, so it, it has very little quantitative, but it has a lot of qualitative measures as to whether it's a substantial part. Uh, and have you um, breached one of the exclusive rights? The right to publish, the right to adapt. There's a whole bunch of rights set out in the Copyright Act. Um, and is there a defence? Well, the defence is often going to be fair dealing. 
In America, they call that fair use, but it's a much broader concept. Um, another uh, thing might be, well, I, yes, I, I did copy, but I did it for research and study purposes. Um, but it gets complicated, and it gets complicated in places like music, for example. Um, now, Marx is going to sing a song, and I'm going to sing another song at the same time. But I'm going to give him a choice because he may not know the two songs. Do you know um, George Harrison's um, My Sweet Lord? <laughs> you can hum it. You can hum it. My Sweet Lord. Okay, okay no, just hum it because then I'll hum mine. Doodling, doodling. She's so fine, doodling. I really want to know her, doodling, doodling. Well, okay, 1950s song was ruled to have been in the memory of George Harrison when he wrote My Sweet Lord. Shifting to the topic of licensing and very briefly touching upon it, I said earlier that intellectual, very early, I said that intellectual property, particularly copyright, is very much industry based. And uh, so just because you know copyright law or trademark law or patent law doesn't mean that you can shift from one industry to the other and know what to do. Another thing that is a big feature of these industries is they're contract based, massively so. The main point I want to make about copyright um, contracts is that there is a plethora of templates that one needs. We're happy to offer them to you if you wish. There's a plethora of different types of clauses. The only way I can do what I do is if I maintain a clause library and I maintain mm -hmm. templates. In, in other words, you have to have structures for the workflows that apply to all these var various industries. You can't have one generic license, one generic... Uh, uh, assignment agreement, etc., etc. It, it varies enormously. There are no standards, pretty much. There are standard transaction types, but there aren't established royalty provisions and whatnot, especially in this time of change. Now, case study. This is the final section of this talk. Um, so, in this case study, we're going to have a look at how you might structure. An organisation that either could be existing or it could be to be formed. In this example, not to jump between the existing and to be formed, let's just assume it is to be formed. Assume that you have somebody who has a major portfolio. It could be a portfolio of books, a portfolio of music, a portfolio of films, a portfolio of software. It could even just be a website or an app. In its, in its own way, that's a bit of a portfolio because it, you know, a website has menus and structures and you can spend anywhere from $500 to $5,000 or more for one. So it's a major thing. Um, and an app, similarly, you can spend an enormous amount and people do. Now, so we have a portfolio of some work. So what do we do next? We need to pull into a central place a whole bunch of the IP that's created by different people. Right? Centralise it. So we're going to need an IP assignment deed. Assignment is just an old French word meaning sell. So IP assignment deeds, the creators are selling to that central entity. So we'll need that. And in our shopping basket, we also will um, create an IP holding company to which all those things are being sold. Right? So in this example, we're going to actually form a trust we're going to have an IP holding company acting as the trustee of this portfolio of stuff. And why are we doing this? Because we're trying to manage our IP. We're going to think about shareholdings. So there may be shareholders of the operating company and shareholders, of course, of the IP holding company. If this was a one-person thing, you could have one person as a shareholder, one person as a director of both, all sweet. And why would that one person do it? Because maybe that one person is thinking long term and forming a trust and separately managing their IP portfolio that they've developed. Alternatively, it could be a foundation. And of course, I've mentioned there will be directors of certain of the companies. And who should be a director? People who are capable. Don't make everybody a director. Now, because we have an IP holding company as a trustee and an IP operating company, we need a license between the two. Because if somebody breaches, we need to prove who has got the rights and why do they have it. 
you're going to use a lot of independent contractors, you're going to use some employees as well, so we need agreements with them. Um, a, a lot of the independent contractors could be working for, if it was a charitable thing, could be volunteers, but you need documents of volunteers as well. So then you'll set yourself up for investors. Now, if it's a charitable foundation, the investors might actually be people who are making donations to it. Now, what does this look like visually? You saw at the beginning that blue represents legal entities. If you remember the legal modelling, it was in blue. Uh, the red now is going to be documents, contracts. Uh, the green and the purple are going to be for intellectual property, and the brown is going to be for organisations, companies, bricks and mortar. Thank you. So at the bottom of this graphic, we have a lot of the purple-green stuff dealt with. Uh, we've got the IP assignments, like I said in the prior thing. We've pulled into this foundation now being formed. I'm illustrating this, this foundation now, or this uh, portfolio organising entity, this enterprise that involves the IP holding company and the IP licensing company. So down here, we've dealt with the IP, we, we've got the IP assignment agreements happening, we have a documents list. And you might have an IP register. An IP register can be as simple as yet another table, so you have a, a listing of your trademarks, a listing of the copyright works, a listing of if there was any patents, a listing even of confidential information. Please describe, what was it? We're ready to rock. Green arrows, money. Green is money. And another one. And it's going upwards. And now we've established the operating entity sitting on, <coughs> on top of the foundation, which is IP and the IP holding company. Um, and of course, the operating company has uh, its director, um, it's got a shareholder, it's got employees in this situation already, it's got independent contractors. There may or may not be a need for a shareholders agreement. Now it's going to build a website, which means it's an external party often, and that external party is going to also create IP, which is going to flow back into being an IP assignment deed back into the purple zone. Um, it might be that this is a very small entity, which goes in and works in an incubator as a digital startup. Same deal. Wherever it's externally involved, we want to keep pulling all the IP back into a central repository. It had a Delaware company. It had offices in various jurisdictions. Um, the IP rights were being licensed upwards, um, and then the, and, uh, and various monies and whatnot were coming downwards. So this is the sort of life cycle uh, involving enterprise ownership and structuring. As, a, as one model of doing it. Rather sophisticated way of doing it, but this is the world we live in for people that have significant portfolios and want them managed well. Well, I've, I've done my dash, so thank you for uh, today. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that, that was awesome. Sorry. I mean, that context around these issues is so valuable. Um, I've particularly done a history, so I think it's really interesting as well. Um, and, you know, thank you for all the next